states on Minkowski, vacuum, but with certain occupation number of gravitons, okay? Everything you should be able to reformulate in this language, okay? This is the key point. Uh, Yeah, the off shell, I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, that's, look, we cannot debate an assumption. Let's make this assumption and see how far we go. Okay, that's, uh, I mean, I understand that this is the, this remark that you are saying, it's a fair remark. This is what comes first in mind, of course. We are taught in textbooks that uh, uh, the sources define longitudinal uh, degrees of freedom. They are not real degrees of freedom, but things turns out that when you are dealing with space times with horizons, things change because these things are essentially behave like Bose-Einstein condensates of gravitons at the quantum critical point, and then things are very different, okay? But yeah, this is a absolutely fair remark. Um, now, so basically, what is the key point? The point, key point is that if you have a gravitational background with characteristic curvature radius R, then you should think of it as a state with certain occupation number of gravitational quanta, okay, with characteristic wavelength of given by this curvature radius, okay? This is the picture quantum mechanically. And then the, uh, the radius will be given by, for black holes will be the gravitation radius, for the Hubble will be, for the cosmology will be Hubble radius and so on, okay? Now the point is that now, once you make this assumption, there, there is no room to wiggle. You can give this uh, assumption to a, uh, in fact, to a, to a to, to a first year student, and uh, anybody that knows about h bar omega can estimate how many quanta should be in this kind of configuration, okay, period. If you give the energy of the gravitational field and uh, the, the, this assumption, you can compute it. And the number of quanta comes out to be very interesting because it, it, it as if it depends on the surface, okay? You see that there is a dependence, R square or L Planck. L Planck is the Planck length. And so, uh, but I didn't input any holography or anything like that. This is just simply counting number of quanta, period, okay? Um, well, so th now, the wavelength is given by R, and then from there you discover the following thing. Now, what are the gravitons? The gravitons are uh, particles which uh, have spin zero and mass, uh, sorry, spin two and mass zero, and they interact through certain rules given by Einstein, expansion of the Einstein uh, uh, curvature t t tensor. Uh, Einstein's Lagrangian. Um, so I can define a quantum coupling between gravitons. Uh, that's obvious. So we can define it. And the interesting thing about quantum coupling of gravitons, as you know, is that it depends on the uh, De Broglie wavelength of the momentum transfer. So if you scatter two gravitons, the, the coupling depends on the wavelength. And this is the incredible property of gravity, that coupling changes from situation to situation. Now, once you realize this and com then compare with the previous story, you realize that what you thought as a curved background with certain curvature radius is, oh, by the way, you can, sorry, you can rewrite also alpha in, in conveniently as a ratio of the Planck uh, length square because Planck length is uh, defined through h bar times g Newton. Uh, Planck length uh, square to the wavelength square, okay? As you see, alpha is an intrinsically quantum entity. When I take uh, h bar to zero, it goes to zero as it should, okay? L Planck also goes to zero in that limit. Now, once you compare this with this, you discover that uh, these gravitons with occupation number n, in fact, equal to one over alpha. Now, this is again re uh, very remarkable because the number scales as area, although you never talked about area. This scales as area because the gravitational coupling has this property that it scales as area, period, okay? That's the property of gravity that is quantum coupling scales as area in three plus one dimensions. In any dimensions, by the way, would be the exactly the same relation, okay? Now, this always smell, smells sort of holographic, right? You can imagine that there is something here that uh, already related to the surface. Now, the point is, okay, now you can press on and say, oh, I have the situation, now I should recover everything that, that I know in certain limits, okay? So, for example, uh, you should recover, uh, as, so, how the card metric emerges in this description? In this description, there is no card metric. There is, a, there is a Minkowski vacuum and occupation number of gravitons. Now, if I have a probe, this probe moves in this background and scatters. It's an intrinsically quantum scattering. Then, what, how the, what notion of the card metric emerges? This is a order by order summation of all the scattering diagrams, okay, in this background. 
And you can make one-to-one -one correspondence. Actually, it's totally straightforward. You can see, for instance, this corresponds to the leading term. Uh, so if you, you, everybody know, knows here that uh, I can do, this is classical metric, G mu nu, I can expand classical metric in per perturbations, in classical perturbations, okay? So the first order, second order. Now, the, I can obtain this expansion as a limit of a quantum process, but what is the limit? The limit is that when I take n to infinity, and fix gravitational radius constant, okay? Now, there is one more parameter that you have to decide what to do, h bar. Now, on top of that, if you fix h bar non-zero, then this limit gives you semi-classical situation. In other words, you, have a quant you can have a quantum probe, phi, moving on a classical background. If you also take h bar to zero, then it will be simply cl classical situation. So this is how the metric emerges in this description. Now. This is, so these diagrams, they survive in classical limit. Of course, they survive in semi-classical limit, and they survive in classical limit. There is another set of diagrams which only survives in semi-classical limit. What are these diagrams? These diagrams are the following, that you have certain occupation number of gravitons, and of course, it's an interacting theory, and in an, in a, in an interacting theory, as you know very well, you cannot keep system in the would-be ground state. It always will deplete. Why? Because particles interact, they scatter, and some of the particles will leave the condensate. Now, this is the diagram which reproduces for a black hole the, uh, the Hawking's evaporation in the semi-classical limit. This survives in the semi-classical limit, but vanishes in the classical limit. Uh, in case of inflationary cosmology, this reproduces uh, Starobinsky's gravitational waves or Gibbons Hawking, depending whether you are infl in inflation or, or pure de Sitter. And uh, so now, how inflation differs with, uh, from pure de Sitter is that in inflationary uh, space-time, you have occupation number of other quanta, inflatons. Now, if you have a uh, system also has occupation number of other quanta, let, let me call them n phi, this number, then this depletion is enhanced by n phi over n. Okay, so you deplete more particles, why? Because there are more guys available that you can rescatter it, okay? So this is the this, this, this usual enhancement of the, uh, essentially the enhancement of the, of the branching ratios, the, the kitchen. Now, the, the, I claim that this number, n phi over n, is what is tense, you, you all remember that in inflation, right, the, the scalar perturbations are enhanced relative to gravitational waves. That's why they are enhanced, okay? This is exactly enhancement of scalar perturbations because scalar perturbations come from the depletion of gravitons when they rescatter at the inflatons, and the tensor perturbations come when in graviton gravi from the graviton graviton scattering, and they don't have this enhancement factor. Okay, um, and so on. So now let me uh, try to apply this just to illustrate some points. So what is inter okay, interesting is not the part that we reproduced, uh, which is known. The interesting are new effects. Okay, now what are the new effects? Uh, now let me apply this idea to inflation, all right? So let me take, for instance, m square phi squared at uh, Linde's chaotic inflation. Now, in Linde's chaotic inflation, you know, right, that there is a potential and that there is a scalar field phi, and if the scalar field expectation value is much larger than the Planck, uh, Planck scale, then there is an inflationary regime, okay? So these are two equations, phi moving in the background gravitational field, and then the equation, in turn, phi sources gravitational field, right? These two equations. There is a, you can define two slow roll parameters, standard, okay, which these are epsilon and eta in inflationary cosmology, and when these two parameters are small, then you have an inflationary regime, and the H is approximately constant. Now, the, the, the question is, what is going on quantum mechanically in this system? Why quantum mechanically I have inflation, even? So you can uh, no notice now the following, that now inflaton space-time is a mixture of two Bose fluids. One is graviton fluid, which is always there. Another one is inflaton fluid, which sources gra also sources graviton fluid. Now the occupation number of graviton fluid, you can estimate, you can, is, is, is what I said before. It's like simply uh, um, R, um, the, 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 the scale divided by Planck square. But the occupation number of inflaton fluid is enhanced by one over the slow roll parameter. This is very interesting because this tells you that if you try to make inflation slow roll, depletion blows up, okay? That's why you enhance scalar Degrees, scalar perturbations relative to gravity waves. They are controlled by one over epsilon. 
So, n phi, so essentially depletion is enhanced by n phi over n and goes to infinity when epsilon goes to, to zero. Now, this perfectly matches whatever we know in the inflation. If I take semi-classical limit from here, I will obtain whatever Mukhanov, Chipizov, Starobinsky, these people obtain, okay? But the interesting thing is not to take semi-classical limit because we are not semi-classical. N is finite. You cannot keep N infinite because N depends on the curvature radius and H bar, and uh, that's it, it's fixed. So, um, so for instance, in, uh, the, in the standard inflationary scenario in which Hubble parameter is 10 to the uh, 12 or something like that, so uh, N is approximately 10 to the 12, okay? So the, what, uh, the 10, uh, 100 billion, uh, of gravitons are what make the, the inflationary density space. What's the frequency of the well, the frequency, there are two types. Okay, I, I don't, I don't want to go in too much into this technicalities, but the, 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 they are, you should remember, they are off-shell. So, uh, off-shell standard, to, so the, the, they are ones which have frequency but no momenta. So, for instance, you can have the guys with frequency, the Hubble. I mean, this frequency is Hubble. Uh, frequency, but they, don't, they are not required to have also momenta. You can have guys with pure momenta, no frequency, because they are of shell compared to, they are not, they are not free, they are not, they do not satisfy any free wave equation. Now, the point is that, th so these two equations are very interesting, because these two equations are what the, the, the determine, uh, uh, what determine the uh, evolution of N, okay, in time. So now the point is very simple, right? Uh, so either you tell me that you don't believe that gravitational field has con constituents, okay? Then I cannot argue with you. Although I will think that that's, that's, that's wrong, but I cannot argue. But, but what? Electric. electric field is a little bit, it's, it's a story is a little bit similar, but there, there, are, there are fundamental differences because of quantum criticality. But I'll, I'll um, so I'm not discussing electric field in this talk, but it's true, it's the same thing, you can think, the point is the following. Of course, I'm not saying that you can always think about an electric field being composite of longitudinal gravitons. But static electric field Come on, I mean, there are papers in which people derive as, as longitudinal gravitons, but the point is not that. The point is how useful is that, okay? This is, the, uh, the, the, this is a textbook case. You can rewrite this through BRST quantization. You can think of it as a vacuum with, when you annihilate the source. Or it, you can, this is not the point. The point is, how useful is this? What I claim is that for the space times, when, which have classically horizon, this is extremely, not just useful, this is necessary. For electric field, you don't gain much if you, if you, if you recast the electric field as occupation number of certain longitudinal photons. You are absolutely right. Let me continue, okay? <laughs> Let me continue. No, we, what you are saying is correct, but I, I mean, that's, I don't know what, uh, uh, all I'm saying is the following, that there are cases in which this representation is extremely important. I'm telling, I'm demonstrating these cases, okay? Now, we can only debate here an assumption. The assumption, I cannot debate because it's, it's very hard to debate assumptions. I mean, the postulate is extremely hard to debate. But if you think that the gravitational field should not be thought as being composite and is a fundamental elementary entity, then there is no problem. I mean, then, we, th th then there is nothing to discuss. So let me stay with this uh, picture, okay? Now, the point is the following. Then these are two master equations uh, which, uh, which control the, uh, the, 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 the change of the reservoir. So in other words, once you accept constituents of the gravitational field, then you can think about the metric, okay, as a it's a finite reservoir of occupation numbers. And the, the particle creation is not a vacuum process. This is the fundamental difference, right? So in the standard picture, particle creation is a vacuum process. In the Hawking picture, for instance, or in standard inflationary perturbations, why? Because you have a background which is not changing, and you are creating particles on this background. Of course, we only recover that in infinite n limit, because in infinite n, the 